वेलकम टू द वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक दैट इज ट्यूबर क्लोसिस वी ऑल नो दैट ट्यूबर क्लोसिस इज वन ऑफ द लीडिंग कॉज ऑफ इन्फेक्शियस डिसऑर्डर्स वन थर्ड ऑफ द वर्ल्ड पॉपुलेशन इज हैविंग ट्यूबर क्लोसिस नियरली अराउंड टू मिलियन पीपल विल डाई ड्यू टू द ट्यूबर क्लोसिस एवरी ईयर सो दिस इज अनॉर्मिंग नंबर इज देयर फॉर द ट्यूबर क्लोसिस nearly 9 million people new cases will be detected every year 95% of these cases occurs in the developing countries like in india all it is because of the over crowding over explosion of the population the poverty we have a malnutrition is a big problem and there are so many other social causes so all these factors will interact with each other and cause the high burden of the tuberculosis or the society nowadays it is the hiv and aids which are the class uh, emergence of this particular endemic resulting in the high increased incidence of the tuberculosis almost since 1985 the incidence of tuberculosis is again gone up mainly because of the hiv and aids other disorders like even diabetes immunosuppression and even drug resistance is the one which is again the problem in eradication of this tuberculosis although the bessere has discovered almost a century back in 1882 itself robert koch has discovered the tuberculosis bessere till date we are not able to eradicate the tuberculosis mainly because of the various factors of tuberculosis bessere itself tuberculosis is highly communicable disease it is a chronic disease it does not come within 2 3 days it is a chronic disease it takes months or years to develop and establish its kingdom what is the prop- property of this tuberculosis bessere is it is having an ability to stay remain alive for many many years it remains alive within within in inactive form it remains alive for many many years and it is having that capacity to relatively having high reactivation rate again whenever the person's immune status goes down the tuberculosis bessere gets reactivated and such a person suffer from tuberculosis the problem with the eradication of tuberculosis is mainly because of the drug resistance strains that are coming up and the close association of the tuberculosis tuberculosis with a hiv infection let us have a look on the microbiology of the tuberculosis bessere it is called as mycobacterium because it looks like a fungus it is a fungus like bacteria it is a facultative intracellular bacilli obligate aerobes it needs a small quantity of air for its growth and development it is non motile there is no toxins produced by the tuberculosis bacilli it's non sporing the weapon that is used by the tuberculosis bacilli is the thick mycolic acid coat that is there on its cell wall because of this mycolic acid wax in the cell wall this particular bacilli will not take any other stains except we have a stain acid fast bacilli stain or jeden stain gil nelson stain this bacilli will not stain easily and it resist the decoloration by the acid we will use the stain so called as carbol fission stain we also use the strong acids that's why we call it as acid fast bacilli we have two groups the classical one are mycobacterium tuberculosis that's the one which is common in human beings sometimes in a persons who are drinking unpasteurized milk they can get a mycobacterium bovis infection and it can cause intestinal tuberculosis whereas in hiv and aids patient they develops a typical tuberculosis mainly caused by mycobacterium avium and intracellular a spread of tuberculosis disease it is mainly through the droplet infection infective bacilli are the aerosolized by coughing sometimes even by sneezing and even speaking as many as 3000 infectious nuclei will be there per cough in active tuberculosis cases so that indicates the high infectivity rate of this tuberculosis bacilli spread of infection also depends upon the the close intimacy of the contact the total duration of a contact degree of infectiousness of uh, cases and variety of other environmental factors and even host factors 
what actually happens with the very first exposure of the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacilli so it's all the cell mediated immunity will take place so in previously unexposed and immunocompetent persons it all depends on the development of the anti mycobacterial cell mediated immunity so when we use the word cell mediated it is mainly by t lymphocytes and the macrophages it results in the resistance to the bacteria and hypersensitivity response will occur the type 4 hypersensitivity re reaction will occur to the mycobacterial antigens so what are the cells that are involved in the pathogenesis of tuberculosis so it is mainly mediated by t helper 1 cells they will stimulate the macrophages to kill the bacteria but this immune response it comes at a cost of tissue destruction so there is a hypersensitivity reaction that also accompanied with the tissue destruction so what are the various patterns of tuberculosis infection we classify the tubercular infection into two entities primary tuberculosis and the secondary tuberculosis primary tuberculosis is very common in the children it is the initial site of infection we call it as gon complex especially it is the hilar group of lymph nodes which are commonly show this particular gon complex nearly in most of the cases these granulomas will get resolved easily by themselves and there is no much further spread of a disease it all depends on the case to case it's all depends on the immune response of the particular individual whereas secondary tuberculosis is very very common in the adults it is mainly due to the reactivation of the previous infection or sometimes due to the reinfection particularly when the health status goes down this is what actually happens in a patient with a hiv infected individual as their immune status goes down because the cd4 t helper lymphocytes are the one which are main target for hiv virus when those lymphocytes goes down then there is reactivation of this latent tubercular bacilli so that's how they are very prone for development of the tuberculosis so in the secondary tuberculosis the granulomatous inflammation is much more florid and intense and it is more of widespread the most common site of tuberculosis infection in the lung is the upper lobe of a lung that is said to be more oxygenated area of the lung and cavity formation also more common in that particular area so remember go back to have a look of the chronic granulomatous inflammation what i have described in the second chapter that is inflammation chapter where i have totally described this particular pathogenesis of tuberculosis it is nothing but a granulomatous response it is a type 4 hypersensitivity reactions which involves mainly the t lymphocytes and macrophages the macrophages they themselves convert into epithelial macrophages aggregation of these epithelial macrophages we call it as granulomatous lesion within this macrophages the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacilli remains latent viable for many many years and it is not so easily digestible by the macrophages alone they take a help of t lymphocytes to neutralize this particular bacilli have a look at uh, this pathogenesis of tuberculosis once again so this is a macrophage antigen presenting cell it's our or phagocytic cell but the tubercular bacilli is having thick mycolic acid coat that the bacteria is not so easily phagocytable or uh, it is not possible to destroy by the phagocytic cell itself it takes a help of a t lymphocytes so it submits the mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen to the t helper cells the cd4 t helper lymphocytes they keep on secreting various interleukins interleukin 2 interferon gamma interferon gamma is the most potent cytokine to attract the circulating monocytes the circulating monocytes leave the blood circulation and enter into the tissues and these mac monocytes or macrophages themselves will be converted into epithelioid macrophages or epithelioid histocytes so in a classical tuberculosis granuloma what we see is this central area of caseous necrosis it all indicates that many 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 more the inflammatory cells have undergone death by necrosis it is all the fight between the tubercle bacilli and the inflammatory cells so the death of inflammatory cells will take place they sacrifice themselves and that's why you see 
extensive area of caseous necrosis in a classical case of tubercular granulomas. We have to see the granulomas unless we see activated uh, macrophages in the form of epithelial macrophages. Unless we see granulomas, we will not call the case as tuberculosis. That epithelial cell granulomas will be surrounded by tight collection of chronic inflammatory cells, mainly composed of lymphocytes and few plasma cells. Sometimes these epithelial macrophages will fuse themselves to form so called as Langhans type of giant cells where there is a classical horseshoe shaped pattern of arrangement of these nucleus will take place. Finally, if the case shows a healing effort, then there will be a layer of fibroblast. It is not seen in all the cases, only if the tuberculosis lesion heals, then only you see this layer of fibrosis. Sometimes there can be even dystrophic calcification of the tubercular lesion can take place in a healed case. So totally the mass can be turned into calcified area. So this is again diagrammatical representation. Central zone of a caseous necrosis that is surrounded by second zone of epithelial cell macrophages. So sometimes they may fuse to form a Langhans type of giant cells that is surrounded by third layer of cuffing of the lymphocytes and the plasma cells. And in rare cases, if they show healing, then they only there will be a layer of fibrosis. So this is how the classical tubercular granulomatous lesions will appear under microscope. So have a look how actually it appears under microscope. Extensive area of caseous necrosis, Langhans type of giant cells, some are formidable type of giant cells here. Again, you see the classical epithelial cell macrophages. They are the one which will have sole of foot appearance. So they are scattered here and they are forming, of course, tight aggregates. And this is Langhans type of gen cell, which is very striking. So this area of sparse area of caseous necrosis is here, pink homogeneous material. And here is the lymphocytes and the plasma cell cuffing. So this is how the epithelial macrophages and Langhans gen cells will appear. Have a look of these epithelial macrophages. So they are the one which will have open chromatin, very prominent nucleoli and they are pale staining cells. So this is how the macrophages are here. When these macrophages will appear in aggregates like this, we call it as granuloma. The mandatory to diagnose as a confirmation of tuberculosis is presence of this acid fast bacilli stain. So you have to do G. Lenson stain unless you do and uh, confirm yourself. I cannot issue a diagnosis as tuberculosis unless I see the tubercular bacilli. If tubercular bacilli is not seen, we just report the cases as granulomatous inflammatory condition, probably a tuberculosis. So one has to confirm by doing the Jeden stain like this. So here the acid fast bacilli are beautifully seen within the macrophages. What is Gons complex? So remember, it is very common in children. So it's a primary tuberculosis. That's a pattern of initial infection with the tuberculosis very commonly seen in the children. Reactivation of this particular Gons complex can result in the secondary tuberculosis, which can occur in the adults. So primary tuberculosis and primary progressive tuberculosis. In non-immunized individuals, especially in uh, children, they develop a primary tuberculosis. It is a self-limited disease. Patient can have a gone focus or gone complex, or we call also also we call it as primary complex. So this particular lesion can further progress. Sometimes it is common in pediatric age population that they can have tubercular meningitis. So especially the malnutrition is again problem in countries like in India. So these malnourished children are very very prone for tubercular meningitis and what we call it as miliary tuberculosis when it spreads outside the lung or the entire lung may show the miliary seeds. Even 10% of adults can have a primary progressive tuberculosis especially it is true for the immunosuppressed individuals like HIV and AIDS patients. Then what is secondary tuberculosis? It is post primary in the immunized individuals. There can be a formation of cavitatory granulomatous response, it could be due to the reactivation or sometimes it could be due to the reinfection. Remember, apical, lobe of the lo apical, apical lobes of the lungs are very commonly get affected because upper portion of the lung is said to be more well oxygenated than the lower portion. So there can be again extensive caseous necrosis, there can be even cavity formation, we call sometimes use the word soft granulomas. And once they undergoes fibrosis, 
they, they will turn into hard. Pulmonary and extrapulmonary tuberculosis can take place. They can spread outside the lung. So it could be even systemic spread. Then we call it as miliary tuberculosis. It can spread through the vein via left ventricle to whole portion of the body. Sometimes through the arteries it will spread within the lung. Then we call it as miliary spread within the lung. So reactivation occurs around 10 to 15 percent of the patients. Very commonly around 30 to 50 years of males are more common than the females. It is slowly progressive. It takes several months to develop. So classical signs and symptoms of secondary tuberculosis are production of a cough associated with the sputum, low grade fever, especially it is so called as evening rise of a temperature. Patient will tell that he or she having a more sweats at night. There will be a fatigue, weight loss. So recent weight loss is again very important criteria. So chronic cough lasting for more than six months that is again one should suspect about this tuberculosis. Hemoptosis and pleuritic chest pain can also occur in severe cases. It is all because of the erosion of the, the vessels inside the lung parenchyma. So have a look of this grass specimen of miliary tuberculosis. There is a medially that means millet like grain like structure. So this is a cheesy white appearance of the lung parenchyma and cut section. There is extensive microscopic spread of this particular disease so it can spread through the blood or sometimes along the bronchial tree so it all indicates that patient is having low immune status so it can even spread systemically to the distant organs we have one more entity cavitatory tuberculosis or cavitary tuberculosis when that necrotic tissue is coughed out there will be a formation of a cavity so these cavities can be classically seen in the x-rays so cavitation is typical for the large granulomas and cavitation is more common in the secondary reactivation of tuberculosis and especially seen in the upper lobe of the lungs. We have so many diagnostic methods for tuberculosis but still the gold standard nowadays is again G. Lansenstein but problem is that it is around 60% sensitivity. Its problem mainly is with the staining technique as such. If you do, don't do the staining properly then again there is a chance that you can miss the uh, best line. Clinical features, they are not con confirmatory, but you have to take those things also into consideration. You should take a clinical feature of recent weight loss, evening rise of temperature, productive cough, all those things will help you that you can to suspect the case as tuberculosis. Sometimes release of acid wash bacilli from cavities is, is intermittent. That's why only one sputum examination may not be contribute, uh, confirmatory. You have to do two samples sometimes even three samples at least two negative smears should assure the low infectivity of that particular cases culture is in fact a more specific and specific test but there is a problem with the culture it takes a long time so conventional media is so called as Lewenstein Jensen media so three to six you need to wait for the culture to grow nowadays we have automated techniques within nine to sixteen days the culture will come positive. The best diagnosis is of course the polymerase chain reaction which is available but should be done only by the experienced laboratories. There is very, there is very high chance that false negative or false positive results can come with the PCR techniques. So with the experienced hands the diagnosis can be confirmed with the PCR techniques. Then again you have to do the what we call PPD tuberculin testing. 0.1 of uh, the PPD should be injected on the forearm, especially in the subcutaneous plane. And uh, you should look for the formation of the wheel. And induration is more important than the wheel formation at the erythema. So there can be some amount of itching, but patient should be advised that you should not rub the mark what is done for the injection site. So measure the size of that induration. Is it 5 millimeters or a 10 millimeters or a 15 millimeters? So before 72 hours, you should not take a measurement. It is not the diagnostic. So sometimes it will come positive only after two to four weeks. So you have to wait for some time. And if you give BCG, it gives positive reaction. So what is the tuberculin test as such is it is actually not the diagnosis of the tuberculosis, but 
if it is positive it indicates that the person is infected with the tuberculosis but it does not indicate whether the patient is having the disease proper or not you have to do other investigations to confirm the cases so we call it as more than 10 mm is the positive test less than 5 is the negative test 6 to 9 is the equivocal if it is negative it does not rule out the disease that you need to remember negative could be because of no exposure to the tubercular antigen itself or sometimes it could be really energy that means our body does not respond to this tubercular injection as such and repeat testing does not cause any conversion from positive to the negative case or negative to the positive cases so that's how the tuberculin test importance is it is to measure the epidemiologic prevalence the epidemiologic prevalence rate you can measure with the tuberculin test dose efficacy of vaccine can be estimated with the tuberculin test testing and it also an aid in diagnosing the active infections in infants and the children so what are the proper diagnostic methods for tuberculosis as such so unless you demonstrate the bacilli most of the time we will not be sure that it's a case of tuberculosis well, that's the importance of jet and staining especially for sputum samples but you can also take other samples uh, to diagnose the tuberculosis culture is the one which is more specific it is also important for identification of tuberculosis and by doing that you can also do the culture and sensitivity drug susceptibility you can predict and the most confirmatory is in fact pcr but it is cost effectiveness we have to measure and serology is nowadays not recommended by the who since 2011 so what specimen you have to send for the laboratory diagnosis of tuberculosis sputum is the easiest and very important sample sputum positivity is the best technique you can also send the bronchial biopsies bronchial velar lavages in children you can also send the gastric lavages if you are suspecting extrapulmonary tuberculosis one should send the blood urine fecal material sometimes even csf or other body fluids biopsy of like tubercular lymphadenitis the lymph node biopsy can be done any organ biopsy can be done sometimes fnac technique with the fine needle aspiration techniques we will started giving so many cases of tubercular lymphadenitis so fnac is again by aspirating you will take out the caseous necrotic material stain with the afb stain you will see the afb stain positivity you will see also the granulomas very classically in these uh, aspirations pus swab is not indicated it is contraindicated so remember my friends the the most important and simple test for diagnosing tuberculosis is the gene nelson stain so that you have to do and you have to examine for the bacilli and our eye emulsion field so i am not going to details about the treatment aspect of tuberculosis prevention it's mainly the bcg vaccination preventive chemotherapy should be given especially if the child is having those signs and symptoms and if it is in close contact with the infected cases basic of control is prompt early detection is very important treating with a short course of directly absorbed chemotherapy that's the one which almost uh, cures the disease from from the patient so one has to identify the active cases who are positive for their sputum and start aggressive treatment in those cases ppd positive in high risk group should be treated with the prophylaxis so what are the anti tubercular drugs and other things you will also learn in the different video presentations of the our md crack series thank you